Research, according to Wikipedia, is a creative and systematic work undertaken to increase the stock of knowledge. This is a necessary tool in order for us to find ways to solve a problem. Whether it's about growing a business through market research, finding ways to cure a certain disease by experimentation, or even knowing how to simplify one's life through technological breakthroughs, research is the tool for the job. We may tend to take for granted and overlook all the things we use for our daily lives, but every innovation that we have today are thanks to those researchers who spent valuable time and effort to make all of these things possible. Technology is one of the few great examples for this. Computers before are bulky, power-hungry, and expensive. Now, they fit right in our pockets, runs on batteries, and is relatively cheap. There's a lot of examples for this, but the best one is the device we're using all the time, the smartphone. Many of us may or may not know this, but this device is as capable as our desktops or laptops. You can even connect a keyboard, mouse, and a monitor on your phone and you got yourself a desktop alternative. I mean a desktop alternative, not replacement of course. Google and other manufacturers are still finding ways to improve on this, like Samsung's DeX or Desktop Experience, Huawei's Emotion UI Desktop, or even Google themselves with their own native desktop support. But how have those researchers done the so-called impossible? How have they found a way to make a device as big as a room smaller and somewhat better in every way? How do businesses or companies know what product to produce? How do medical scientists know that these medicines help or even work? This of course takes a lot of time, effort, and some skills acquired not only in schools or by ourselves but from collecting it from the outside world. What's up everyone? My name is Sean and today we'll take a quick look on our subject for this semester, Quantitative Methods. Just a quick reminder, this video is just an introduction to the series of lessons that we'll tackle in the future. We're not going to deep dive on some of the terms that we have here, so if you have questions or even some ideas to add in a future video, comment down below. Now let's start off to the first step in studying quantitative methods, the basics on data science. Any research starts off with a question or a problem that must be answered. The problem may vary, but in order for us to answer it, we must collect related data. Most subjects that you had before on your course, information technology, computer science, and others, have already discussed what data is. Basically, data are facts and statistics collected together for reference or analysis. It can take on many forms, including numbers, words, measurements, observation, or even description of things. These data are necessary for us to know whether our problem already exists and has been answered, if it has some relation to other problems, or if it is possible at all. Just one of the few reasons for you to pursue a problem, of course. Now that we've done collecting these data, we must know how can we analyze and extract information from all of these. We must assume that we will not use all of it. We must eliminate all the inconsistent ones that may ruin the outcome of the project and leave the ones that we will need for further tests of the viability of the system that we want to create in order to solve the problem we identified in the first place. This is where we'll take the steps in KDD or Knowledge Discovery in Databases. This is a vital process done in a data science project in order for us to predict, describe, or prescribe the outcomes of our research. This will be further discussed in a later lesson, but in a nutshell, KDD is the selection of certain data in a database that contains the data that we've collected, data pre-processing that cleans the data, data analysis that allows us to create both datasets for training and testing, and data mining that establishes the patterns behind the datasets. After establishing the datasets, we must, of course, Test and explore these data for us to know if they are viable to create the model we want to make. We can now visualize the dataset into a model and create certain scenarios for the model to interact with. But how will we establish this scenario? 
Will these data achieve the desired results or most of them are not suitable for the model we are looking for? For this, let's go to our next topic, modeling and simulation. Data mining has different algorithms to establish patterns based on what kind of research we're trying to use. The next step is to explore these data through visualization. How will the data describe the system we want to create and the users of the said system? We can always create the system then let the users indicated on the data to play with it, but this comes with risks. We have to consider the cost of making the system, the risk to the system makers, and the risk to the testers. Is it ethical to test this through various physical experiments? Will it be costly? Consider all of these and more, we will have to go to our next step, modeling and simulation. Modeling and simulation refers to using models as a basis for simulations to develop data as a basis for managerial or technical decision making. This is also a discipline of understanding and evaluating the interaction of parts of a real or theoretical system by designing a representation or a model and executing the model including the time and space dimensions or simulation. Modeling and simulation influence the developments in the fields of system theory, system engineering, software engineering, artificial intelligence, and many more. So there are two parts of this. The first part is the modeling, and this is the art or process of developing a system model. This means we'll create an abstract or a simplified representation of an existing or theoretical system, entity, phenomenon, or a process. Models may be physical or a smaller or larger copy of an object, for example, a smaller version of a car or a larger version of an atom. Next, we have mathematical, which is a description of a system using mathematical concepts and language. And lastly, we have logical or a representation made of composition of concepts. So an example for this can be a flowchart. After making a model, a simulation is done which manipulates the model to represent how the system works. This method of implementing a model and a simulation are either statistically that changes the variables on a model to show different scenarios or physically where the physical model is taken to different scenarios that consist of events on Earth, which may consist of gravity, friction, or others. I just want to point out that simulation is really different from emulation, where we're trying to imitate the capabilities of a certain hardware, and we'll try to discuss that in a later video. Modeling and simulation allows us to research further on our quest to find the answer to the problem we're intending to solve. Representing real systems that allows representing the dynamics of a system via simulation allows exploration of the system behavior in an articulated way, which is often either not possible or is too risky in the real world. So for example, we would like to know how a certain car's engine works while it's running at a certain speed. It could be dangerous if we do it on a real car, on a real public road, with real people. It is cost-effective as in many cases, we cannot afford to find the right solutions by experimenting with real objects. It's not always the right thing to spend on an item we thought we need only to find out later that a better alternative is suited for the job. And those are some of our topics in quantitative methods and that's it for our video for today. Next week, we'll discuss further on the basics on data science, so if you have some ideas for that, you can write it down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one.